So yeah, my presentation, I uh, decided to uh, uh, give it the title Minimum Depackage Build Package. The title is kind of a play on maximum RPM, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but yeah, uh, essentially, this is kind of a distilling of some uh, notes that I'd made as I was learning this stuff. Uh, plus, uh, as I decided to do this presentation, I went looking for other resources online that uh, kind of expanded my knowledge, uh, which is still kind of in the infancy stages of building um, uh, deb packages from source. Uh, so just a little bit of background about me. Um, those of you who've known me for a while know some of this early stuff, but yeah, I've been working with Unix of one sort or another since 1979. Uh, started with um, uh, Bell Labs, uh, AT&T uh, version seven Unix and um, after um, uh, starting in my current job at the U of M in 1989, I uh, then transitioned to working at the time with uh, DEC Ultrix and then Sun OS 4 and then Solaris. Um, and uh, started with Linux fairly early on, but a few years into its existence. Uh, started initially with the Slackware distribution um, quickly transitioned to Red Hat when we got a couple of um, DEC Alpha 64-bit architecture systems, uh, and they came with uh, Red Hat Linux workstation pre-installed on them. And so I made the switch from Slackware to Red Hat, and there was no looking back for a long time. I, I stuck with Red Hat and Red Hat clones for many years since then. Um, and still maintain scientific Linux, CentOS, Alma Linux, uh, you name it. Um, but in more recent years, I've had to start supporting uh, uh, Ubuntu systems especially, and then um, uh, started dealing more with Debian-based distributions when the Raspberry Pi came out. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been working with... Uh, uh, Raspberry Pi OS in one form or another for almost a decade now, but somehow managed to avoid having to build packages from source until about April, May of this year. Um, having a, a longer history with Red Hat, I became familiar with the RPM build process, uh, but I am, as I said, still very new to the build process under Debian. Um, I did find the Red Hat build process daunting at first, but uh, an excellent book at the time, uh, written in, I think sometime in the uh, late 90s or early 2000s, I'm not sure exactly when, a book called Maximum RPM that really explained the whole ecosystem of RPM and, and how to build it, uh, build um, uh, packages from source in that environment. I haven't found an equivalent to that for the Debian world. I've found a bunch of tutorials and reference material online that all give kind of partial pictures of that. So I'm still looking for that one, you know, um, tome that, that explains the whole process. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, this is kind of my, my early first stab at it, and hence the, the, the play on the name Maximum RPM. Uh, so this is really just like it, the infancy of the process. So um, what I hope to give you with this presentation, as I said in the abstract, is just kind of a minimum working set of uh, tips and tricks for uh, working in the Debian build environment. So hence, minimum. So just uh, if you're wondering why uh, someone would want to build packages from source, um, I mean, if you're coming from the Red Hat environment, this, this may not be a surprise to you because there tends to be, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit more limited amount of stuff that's available pre-compiled in package form. So every once in a while you need to, to build packages from source. With Debian and with Ubuntu, 
there is so much, if it's not available in the, the native repositories, there's so much third-party repositories available of pre-compiled binary packages for those distributions. But every once in a while, you do come across a package that you can't find a pre-compiled binary for it. Or maybe the existing package uh, is out of date compared to the actual source code because whoever was maintaining it has kind of given up on it or has just fallen behind. So you need some features out of the latest version and the pre-compiled packages are out of date. Another reason might be that you need a configuration that is somehow tweaked differently than... Uh, uh, than what is available in the pre-compiled package. Um, sometimes you just need particular libraries installed when you build the source to get these features enabled. And uh, in the build environment that the pre-compiled binary was, was built, um, they didn't have those. So for instance, you want to use Slurm with uh, OpenMPI and it was built on a system that didn't have open MPI, so you're SOL unless you build from source. That's an actual real world case for me. That's my my second foray into building from source was to rebuild Slurm for, uh, for the latest uh, Ubuntu LTS. Um, other reasons, uh, there might be some bugs in the, uh, the current version of the, or the most current version of the package and it's been fixed in the upstream source, or you uh, just need to install some security patches that have been backported to that version, but again, it's not available in the binary package. So there's lots of reasons why you'd want to build from source. And all the reasons I mentioned um, are examples of why you'd want to build from source, but not necessarily why you'd want to go to the trouble of actually building the package as opposed to just doing the classic uh, holy trinity of uh, config, make, make, install. <laughs> so um, why would you really want to do it the whole rigmarole of building the packages? Well, the last bullet point I have here uh, attempts to explain the reason for that. It's that there's lots of good stuff that comes with the whole package management environment. So it makes it easy to install, upgrade, and remove packages. Um, you can build the package once and then you can install it on your whole fleet of uh, systems that you're maintaining. So um, yeah, there's lots of advantages for doing that. So I'm going to assume um, that those are clear now and that you really want to go ahead with this. Uh, and so Here's my, my case study I'm going to use for tonight. The Slurm example is a little too involved to deal with tonight. It, it was much more elaborate. So it was a good thing that back in April, May, I had a smaller uh, simple test case to, to experiment with. It was an easier way to get my feet wet with this. So if, you, uh, if some of you might recall way back on the roundtable mailing list, I asked about um, alternatives to mod SUPHP um, and basically got a goose egg back. <laughs> uh, got a few useful tips, but nothing really um, that uh, was helpful in getting me uh, 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 set up on a newer system with uh, mod SUPHP not being available. It's essentially considered obsolete. Um, what I did find on some online forums, uh, some people suggested an alternative um, called mod RUID2, which is a more general purpose uh, and much simpler um, module for Apache than mod SUPHP. It's not limited to PHP. You can use it on other uh, file types. Um, so I decided to go ahead with that, but it turns out that on Ubuntu, which is where I wanted to install it, um, the package for mod RUID2 is very stale. It's using, it's compiled using source from about a decade ago uh, and hasn't been updated since. I mean, they've done rebuilds for newer versions of the system, but um, it's still based on the, the ancient source. The source was um, based on a, a 
a tarball that is no longer supported. The source has since been migrated to GitHub. And so the GitHub master for it uh, has actually had a few small minor updates to it, even though they've kept the same version number they had in the old um, tarball that used to be found on SourceForge. Why they didn't update the version number, I don't know. Maybe they thought the updates they did were too trivial, but there's there's a few of them anyway. There's also a fork uh, of the, the uh, master source called userdir, which has a useful extension that I wanted uh, in my version as well. So, um, I, and there was also a tweak I wanted to do the, to the config to allow uh, me to put a few restrictions on mod RUID based on things like um, directory directives or file directives. And um, for whatever reason, the way they had set up the config, uh, it didn't work. You had to do it in the global scope in your Apache configuration which was too broad and general for what I wanted to do. So I decided I'm going to need to rebuild from source. And as I just said in the previous slide, there's advantages to keeping it as a package. So I wanted a plug-in replacement for the obsolete um, uh, Ubuntu uh, pre-compiled package. If I have time at the end of this presentation, I can walk you through a little bit of a demo of uh, what that looks like. But uh, in these slides, I am using this kind of as the case study. So a lot of the example files I'm gonna show are, are based on this. Oh, also, by the way, a lot of my slides here have uh, footnotes with uh, URLs. Uh, this is basically a bunch of the resources that I found useful as I was learning this. So. Um, my slide deck is already available on the MUG website. Uh, it's really just kind of a cursory overview. I encourage you to follow the links in the, the footnotes because that's where I got a lot more uh, information, a lot more in-depth information than what I'll have time to present tonight. So I'm also going to assume that... Um, D package, build package is the right tool for you in the case that's, uh, in any case, that, that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, it is the right tool to use if you're starting with um, installed package source. In other words, you've gotten the source Debian package and you've installed that. So you've expanded it out into the source tree. Um, uh, so you're starting with the source that's already in the, the packaged form. It's, it's ready to then just build the binary packages. Um, so yeah, uh, if, if you're getting the source from other uh, sources than an actual Debian source package, uh, there are other tools in the Debian build ecosystem that might be better suited to the task. Um, so for instance, if you're just starting with a tarball as source or with just a plain Git um, uh, source repository, um, th there are other ways. I'm not going to focus on that for two reasons. One, I don't have time tonight. And two, I don't have the experience. My experience has been with using uh, dpackage, build package, I just know there are other commands out there that let you uh, work at either a higher or a lower level uh, with other types of source. Um, so yeah, some of the tutorials that uh, I link to in the footnotes uh, do talk about those. So I would encourage you to look into that if you're interested in a different entry point into this. So um, before you actually uh, are ready to build your packages from source, um, most of the tutorials give you a few preliminary steps you need to do. And the various tutorials, depending on their age and who wrote it, <laughs> they might uh, give you a different list of steps to follow. I've distilled it down to a few of the essential steps that I uh, found useful. 
Um, the first step is you need to install a few packages that contain all the tools you're gonna need. Um, so most of the tutorials recommend you install a package called Build Essential, Deb Helper. Some of them also uh, suggest you install Quilt um, and an environment called Fake Root. Um, some of these may not actually be necessary. Quilt is only gonna be necessary if you're going to deal with patches, which in a lot of cases will be needed. So um, you may as well just bite the bullet and install it from, from scratch um, the first time. Um, the ones that I've listed in italics on that first bullet point are some that have been recommended in various tutorials, but uh, the tutorial I was following initially didn't recommend those, and it turns out I didn't need them for what I was doing. So I've included them just in case you might need them, but um, you may not. Your mileage may vary. Um, Fake Root, I believe, now comes as a standard dependency on Deb Helper, so you may not need to list it explicitly. Um, the second bullet point, uh, the one of the tutorials recommended you add a couple uh, exported environment variables into a file like your bash RC. I didn't do that when I was starting out and I didn't really notice any downside to that, although maybe my binary packages are missing some useful information in there, I don't know. Um, or maybe this is just uh, useful if you're going to use one of the tools that builds an empty changelog file for you. I was starting with an existing changelog. I'll explain changelogs later, don't worry about that. But yeah, so maybe I didn't need it because of the, the way I was starting the build process. Um, but yeah, they do recommend that. Uh, the next thing you're going to need to do is either add or uncomment a couple uh, or a few uh, deb source statements in the appropriate source list file for apt. Um, the examples I give here are for the latest Ubuntu uh, LTS release, uh, Jammy Jellyfish, I think it's called, uh, better known as uh, 2204 LTS. Um, so yeah, this essentially uh, lets you do uh, apt source commands to download a uh, source package and unpack it uh, so that you're ready to start building from source. And then of course, uh, each of those source packages you're gonna work with is gonna have its own particular tools that it needs to get it built. You might need certain compilers, you might need certain build tools. You will most likely need certain uh, dev packages for particular libraries that are needed. So that, of course, will vary depending on what the package is. So uh, all I can mention is that, in general, you're going to need to worry about installing some other packages. Uh, but there are ways of getting that done fairly simply as well. So yeah, once you've uncommented those deb source files or added them in your, your apt uh, source list, um, you're then ready to run app source and whatever package name. So for whatever binary you had or don't want to use, <laughs> uh, you can do app source on the same package name and it will load into your current directory um, uh, the whole source tree for that package. It'll start by downloading the package, the source package, and then it'll unpack it into the current directory. You are supposed to run all of this and including the whole build process as a non-root user. So don't be running app source as root. Um, you should have uh, done a CD to whatever is the top level source directory where you want to do all your Debian builds. Um, some of the tutorials recommend building a an initial build structure, they recommend a top level directory you can use. I just already had a SRC directory under my home directory. So I created a deb subdirectory under that and all of my packages go under that. So, but you know, you, you put it where you want to. Um, 
And yeah, so so AppSource will install all of that content under your current directory. So you want to make sure you CD to that top level directory first. What does the source directory structure look like? Uh, in general, kind of like this. Uh, so whatever top level directory you've set up, uh, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of packages being built under there um, or uh, being loaded into there. So for every binary package you build, you're going to have a .deb, you're going to have a .dot um, or rig .dot tar .dot some suffix based on the compression used for the original source tarballs. Um, and then you're going to end up with a dot Debian dot tar dot some compression suffix for all the the uh, Debian specific or the build specific uh, extras that are added to the uh, the pristine uh, original source. Um, so then you'll have directories with names like some package name underscore major dot minor and possibly dot release. So uh, that is going to all depend on what package you're installing from source. So in my case, I've got um, libapache2 hyphen mod underscore ruid2 underscore um, some major version, some dot some minor version. Uh, and, and then under that directory is where all of the original source is going to get unpacked. And as well, there's going to be a Debian subdirectory. And that contains all the Debian build specific items. Um, for those of you familiar with the RPM build environment, essentially that is everything you would have in your spec file and in your sources subdirectory uh, for uh, RPM build. Um, it all would be in the Debian um, subdirectory. And this, the equivalent of the spec file is broken up into a number of different files. You've got a changelog file, you've got a control file, you've got docs files, you've got uh, a files file possibly, uh, you've got a rules file. And then if you've got patches to the original source, under the Debian subdirectory, you're going to have a patches subdirectory where you'll have a number of patch files which by convention should end with dot patch, but they don't have to, they can be named whatever. Um, all of those patches will be listed one per line in a file called series. And as the name implies, it lists the series of patches in the order you want them applied. So one file name per line in the order you want them applied. Okay. Let's take a look at some of these meta files. I'm starting with the changelog file, which seems like a strange place to start, especially if you're uh, thinking in terms of an RPM build spec file that'll have a changelog listed within it. You tend to think of changelog as just documentation, right? So it's the last thing you worry about. But actually changelog in the Debian build environment is quite special. It's got a very specific syntax for particular lines in there. And I encourage you to check the man page in section five for, it's called deb hyphen changelog. It will explain a lot of the details about the format, but I'm going to draw your attention to two lines in particular, which um, hopefully those folks at home uh, can see my mouse cursor pointing to this top line. So the top entry in your change log is the most current one. You always build, like you, you, you start the, the file with your most current version, and then below that will just be all the previous ones. So all the previous ones are kind of ignored. They're there just to keep a historical record of uh, all the previous changes. So they are there just for documentation. But the current entry at the top of the file, the first line um, indicates, oh, where's my, yeah. Um, the name of the package and the version of the package. Um, and those will actually be used to generate the file names for uh, the, 
the target binary packages you're going to build. So um, it's important that you get those right here. And um, in the version numbering, uh, there's various conventions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's usually a major, a minor version, and maybe a release version. And then typically there'll be a hyphen, and then there's a package release version. Um, and so that would be for a particular upstream source um, major, minor, and release version. You might end up with several different package releases if all you're doing is you're changing the, the, the Debian package metadata, uh, or you're changing something in the build process. You're changing some of the options in the way you're building this thing. Uh, then you're only going to increment that, uh, that number after the hyphen. Um, and then you may be wondering what this plus NMU is. I was wondering at first when I started seeing that, and some of the tutorials recommend that. you, If you're building your own version, add a plus NMU. Had to look it up to find out what NMU actually stands for. So I included a convenient link here. It turns out it stands for non-maintainer upload. And there's uh, basically a wiki article, uh, debian.org, that explains what that is. And essentially, that's if you're going to go through and build a package uh, and then submit it uh, for inclusion in Debian or uh, in other uh, distributions. Uh, you, it's referred to as a non-maintainer upload because you're not the primary maintainer of that package. You're just providing an upload um, for consideration by the maintainer. Um, and then what I've also seen is after an MU, you can actually put another release number, which would be if you're going crazy and doing multiple releases of uh, the, the maintainer's release, but you're doing several of your own tweaks, you might increment a number after the little NMU tag uh, just to distinguish between your versions. Um, the, then after that, you have a blank line, which is mandatory, a number of indented lines, which can have like um, uh, stars or hyphens or something, uh, typically you'll use stars for bullet points and th that's just documentation. It's not gonna parse that, but the blank line before and after that block is important. And then you have a maintainer line here, which uh, starts uh, with, I believe like one or two spaces of indent and then two hyphens, your name, email address and a timestamp. Now, the man page for Deb Changelog mentions all of this format, but it fails to mention a very peculiar feature about the timestamp. The reason is that isn't an, an original feature, I believe, um, but it does something very weird. And I found out the hard way <laughs> that um, whatever timestamp you put there is going to be used as the quote unquote current time in the build process. I don't know if it's through the fake root environment or through some other magic with uh, that they do with timestamps, but essentially anything during the build process where you've got the current time, like anything that gets compiled, those files will be timestamped not with the actual Unix clock time, but with this timestamp. So make sure you get it in a format that is parsable. I just used a consistent format with the previous uh, changelog file entry, but I believe it, it's, it's probably like the, uh, oh, what's that function that is used for parsing the time? The date command uses it and all of that. There's there's one of the C library functions. Yeah, yeah. strf time. That's the one. Strf time. So I believe you've got a lot of flexibility in how you provide that that string, but I haven't tested that, so <laughs> don't take my word as gospel on that. But yeah, that timestamp is important. Why do they do that? I had trouble figuring that out at first until I. Uh, 
I Googled it. And uh, after a few false positives, I came across something that dealt with reproducible builds. And it turns out this is a trend that has caught on in the Debian build environment and in Ubuntu is they want to be able to have provably reproducible builds. So if I start with a particular source package and I'm starting with a particular pristine distribution and some other guy is doing exactly the same thing on his system, we should end up with exactly the same build to the point where we can do a binary comparison on everything and everything will be the same. Now that gets tricky because, um, well, there shouldn't be any random numbers in anything you're building, but what you will have is in ELF format binaries, for instance, you're gonna have timestamps all over the place. Turns out even if you strip the symbol table, you've still got timestamps in the header and possibly in other parts of the file. Um, and so, yeah, if you want your binaries to be bit for bit identical, uh, to show you've got a reproducible build, you need consistent timestamps. And so that's the reason for doing that. Sorry, that was a lot of time spent on that, but that's because this one had me stumped and I thought I had some weird caching thing that was going on because I was rebuilding my package after doing other tweaks, reinstalling it, and then checking the installed files, the installed binary, and it had a timestamp in the past. And I would delete the installed binary, reinstall it, and still have the same behavior. And I was just baffled by this at first until I found out what was going on. So um, I'm hoping by this very belabored, belabored explanation that I'll, I'll save you some time down the road. <laughs> All right, so that was the um, changelog file. Um, and as I said, it's more important than just documentation. Um, another very important file, this is where essentially all the package metadata will reside. So this would be kind of like in the RPM uh, spec file, this would be that top section with all the headers. So um, you've got uh, typically about two or three sections in here. Uh, one of them is uh, all the metadata for the source. So um, you will have a bunch of, uh, of tags with colons, uh, keywords, colon, and then some value. So you will give the package name. You will indicate what section um, it's supposed to go into. And that, that is basically the, their ways of classifying packages into a bunch of groups or sections. Um, some of this, I don't even really know exactly where uh, or what, what the implications of it are. But again, there is a man page that will explain all of the, um, the format of the control file and also details of each of the field values that are, are possible. Um, just a couple things I'm gonna point out here is the stuff highlighted in red. So in the source section, you've got the build dependencies. Um, and as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, this is where you're gonna to need to, to specify any specific libraries or other um, packages that are gonna be needed in order to be able to successfully build this on a particular system. So if you need some weird compiler that isn't gonna be there by default or any other development tools, uh, this is where you would specify them. The nice thing about having it all on there is it makes uh, certain things more easily automated. So for instance, if you want to install all of these, you can look at the build depends line and type in apt install and all of those things uh, by hand, or you can just run a command like mk build depths or apt build depths, and it will go through and uh, 
um, find that line in the control file and build all your dependent or install all your dependencies for you. Um, and then in the package section or sections, you can you can actually have a large number of binary packages that correspond to one source package. Uh, and yeah, anyone who's done builds in other environments, including in RPM, would be familiar with this concept. Um, from one source package, you might break it up into a number of smaller binary components, some of which will be essential and some of which will be optional. Um, so yeah, it turns out this one's a fairly simple one. So there's just one package definition. And the one line I wanted to point out in there that is uh, important is the depends. So this is runtime dependencies. This is uh, what you need to have installed in order to be able to successfully install and run the binary package, not the buildings from the source. Um, the rules file is essentially a make file, but a very specific make file. It's a make file with a whole bunch of um, predefined uh, macros, I guess you could call them, that are specific to the uh, Debian build environment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what else here uh, is worth highlighting? Oh yeah, um, this this one is, is I, I didn't change this at all. And I wouldn't recommend you go in and change these unless you really know what you're doing. Um, hopefully for the package you want, there's already a working rules file and you can just use that. Uh, if you're building from completely from scratch, um, there are ways of getting like some of the, these meta data files built for you. Um, so that you don't have to do it completely from scratch. Um, there's also on one of the slides, I think I had a link to a, um, there's essentially a hello world source package that you can install that gives you like a very minimal template uh, set of metadata so that you can then just use that as, as a starting point for your own build from source. Um, so yeah, it essentially builds a simple hello world program, but you can swap in whatever program you want and then just start tweaking things as you need to. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so this particular uh, rules file came with the, the um, mod RUID2 uh, source package that I installed, and it already had some patches uh, in it. So it uses something called quilt. I'll explain that a little later. Uh, but yeah, there's this include line in here to uh, get the quilt make uh, rules uh, loaded into there. Uh, that's just so that you can do all the package, uh, the uh, patch management for your package. And then there's a bunch of other lines here that are clearly specific to this particular module. So uh, the destination directory, um, uh, there's a few of the rules here that are going to be specific to the way this is an Apache module. So you use something called APXS2 to build it, to essentially compile the C source with all of the uh, needed uh, baggage uh, that comes with Apache's build environment uh, so that you can get a, a runtime loadable module. Um, and uh, the rules file goes on, actually, I, I even at this small font size, it took me two full slides to get it all in. I don't know what a lot of this stuff does, uh, but yeah, this is stuff you don't wanna mess with unless you really know all the details. But essentially, it just goes to show that there's a lot of separate um, steps involved in the entire build process. And uh, so the Debian helper stuff, all these DH underscore commands or macros are part of the, the, the Deb helper environment uh, that we installed earlier. So, um, so yeah, there's a, a few standard targets to the make file. Um, there's build, install, clean, and then there's binary and binary arch. And so, 
yeah, all of those steps mean something. There's a man page that explains it. Um, again, a lot of this is beyond me. Um, but just, yeah, be, be forewarned that if you're going to customize this, you may need to start customizing a few of the, the make uh, file rules in, in this rules file. Um, or you may be lucky and it's all done for you, like was the case in, in the two packages that I've so far built from source. So then when you actually are ready to build uh, your package um, from the source that you've, you've uh, installed and then tweaked, um, your command looks like that first bullet point, uh, deb, uh, dpackage hyphen build package. There's an optional minus B option, which says build the binary packages only, don't rebuild the source. So if you haven't changed anything to your source or your metadata, you don't need to rebuild the source. If you leave out the minus B, you'll get the source ones. Doesn't hurt even if you haven't changed anything, but if you have changed something, it's good to have those, especially if you're planning to upload them somewhere. Um, there's an option that was recommended in some of the tutorials I was following called minus R or fake root. And if you look at the man page for uh, dpackage build package, it says that minus R is for specifying um, an alternative to running as root. And it's essentially a command that is going to uh, preface a bunch of the build steps. And it turns out that minus R fake root is so often now the recommended way to build uh, packages when you're running as non-root that it's apparently now the default, although some of the tutorials still recommend you put it explicitly. Um, but according to the man page, it's now the default. The next two options, if you're not already set up, set up for signing packages, you will need these, otherwise your build will fail. Um, if you are planning to upload this to any sort of public site, you really need to uh, set yourself up with uh, proper keys for, for signing packages. Um, but yeah, if you're just building these for internal consumption only, um, uh, minus UC uh, is to not sign the build info and dot changes file files and minus us is to not sign the source packages that get built. And uh, another note about this is you run this within the top level directory of the specific package that you've installed. So not the very top level directory I, I had mentioned on this slide here, but the package specific directory. So that's where you run dpackage build package and a bunch of the stuff it's gonna build, it's gonna build in the directory one level up. So it matters not only where you're located, but what's sitting above there. So you really wanna have the proper tree structure set up ahead of time. So I mentioned patches earlier and I mentioned something called quilt. Quilt was something I wasn't familiar with until I started looking at uh, building Debian packages. Uh, so it turns out um, it's kind of like the patch command on steroids, but with some very severe restrictions as well. But there may be a way around some of those restrictions. Um, so Quilt essentially is what goes through the series file in your patches subdirectory of the Debian subdirectory. Um, it will apply a sequence of patches, hence creating a patchwork quilt, I guess is how we called it that. Um, so because it's made to, to be able to build, or, or rather to, to um, apply or remove these patches, it does it in a stack fashion. So it uses concepts of push and pop. So you push uh, patches in, or you can pop them out. So the series matters very much, but also the integrity of those patches matters. 
So Quilt by default insists that there be no fuzz in the patches. If you're familiar with the patch command, you're maybe familiar with the idea of fuzz in this context, not in the InfoSec context, but fuzz is essentially um, some flexibility or some leeway in how the source file can vary from what is indicated in the patch file. So the patch command typically allows um, the offsets to drift by a certain amount. So a particular uh, um, a patch subset in a patch file um, doesn't have to be at the offset that's listed in the patch file. It can, it can drift from there. Um, the context lines are listed to help um, patch find the, where that, that uh, patch block actually applies since it may have drifted. Um, the fuzz is how much those context lines are allowed to change before patch just gives up and says, dude, you're on your own. I can't deal with this. It, it doesn't look anything like the patch file says, or it doesn't look enough like it. So to me, this with the restrictions on quilt seemed very bass backwards because to me, the whole beauty and strength of the patch command was that it had that flexibility. It allowed things to drift. It allowed for fuzz so that you could apply patches to source that might have changed slightly in the area around the patch you wanted, but not exactly on the line you were trying to change. Very useful, especially when you're trying to apply existing patches to a slightly newer version of the upstream source. Um, I guess the idea with Quilt, because it wants, again, this reproducible build idea maybe, uh, but also the idea that you want to be able to uh, be able to apply or undo a whole sequence of patches and have it work exactly without fail. Um, by default, Quilt allows no fuzz, no drift, nothing. And it will just abort if there's any change whatsoever from what it, it's expecting. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Yeah, so all of this makes applying the patches to anything that's newer um, a little bit tricky. So there are ways around that. But before we go into that, let me just go into um, some of the files that, pat that Quilt is going to deal with. Um, so in that patches subdirectory, as I mentioned, there's this series file. This is exactly what it looks like for um, my current modified version of the mod RUID2. Um, the first few patches were already there. Uh, some of those after that I added to essentially get the GitHub source uh, from the user dear fork. Um, so I've set up a bunch of patches so that I can go from the original tarball from 2013 <laughs> to what the GitHub source looks like in the user dear fork, plus the last three patches, which are for my own changes. Uh, one was to tweak the config. One was uh, to handle um, the group list when you want an empty group list. Um, and one was just to do some logging uh, in one particular case. So uh, typically the idea is if you're going to add patches, apply all the existing patches first, make your change, create a, a context diff file based on that, add it to the series file. And as long as you go strictly in a forward linear fashion like that, you should be good. Um, if you try to apply your patches in a different sequence, or if you're applying a patch or you're using a patch file that assumed um, pristine source without the previous patches applied, Quilt is most likely going to give up on it. Um, so you'll you'll need to work around that. And uh, here's just kind of maybe not a so uh, 
not so much a typical patch file, but this is the one, this is the only one I could get to fit on one slide. So it was the most trivial of my patches. It's essentially um, <laughs> a two line source code edition uh, with one blank line as well. So yeah, hence the three plus signs in the middle block there. So it's basically just if we're in a particular uh, config mode, um, add a log entry uh, to the, the log file. Uh, so this was the most trivial patch. So this is this is why I put it in there. Wanted to draw uh, your attention to um, the lines that indicate the file names. If you're familiar with patch files, you've probably already seen this. It's like a diff minus u context diff file. Um, so the unified uh, context diff notation. Um, the line with the pluses is essentially supposed to indicate the file name of the target file. Uh, the line with the three minus signs indicates the previous version of that. Um, I might be wrong about this, but I believe with Quilt, any previous path name components to the uh, actual base name of the file don't matter. You can have any number of levels it's going to find that source file for you, possibly just in a strictly descending sequence, though. I'm not sure. Um, I, I might be overly generalizing. All I know is that the, the top directory name, like I've seen patches where you had A slash and the original source name and B slash and the original source name. It didn't care. Like the, the A and the B don't match the current directory names of your source. It finds it anyway. Um, so it's kind of the equivalent of patch minus P1 in that case, but I've seen others where there was no directory name leading into that. It was just the base source file name. So then that would be like patch minus P0. It was able to handle patches of either format without any distinction. So that's why I put that comment about the path name doesn't seem to matter, but Take that with a grain of salt. There may be cases where it does matter. I don't know about if you've got subdirectories in your source tree, whether you might need to specify those, but anything above that doesn't seem to matter. All right, so adding new patches, as I mentioned, you just add those patches, the patch file name to the uh, series file, but um, if, you're, if you want to build your patches using the quilt the right way, you start by pushing, minus A says all, so you push all your existing patches. Then you use quilt new to specify the new patch file name that you want. And then for that particular patch file, you will do quilt add the source file name you want to change. And then you will edit that source file. You can repeat that sequence of two commands if you've got multiple source files you want to change in the one patch. And then you will do a quilt refresh. And that will essentially generate a new version of that patch file in your Debian patches subdirectory. And that will be a patch file that quilt will be happy with. So, um, so yeah, this is if you're going to change the source manually, this is the way you would do it. And that's the quilt recommended way of doing things. Um, I found an easier hack if you've got an existing patch, but it's out of date. In other words, it's got some fuzz. Um, you can apply it manually. You do a diff minus U to get your your updated patch file and just overwrite the previous patch. And then it works. Quilt is happy with it. Um, and then of course, uh, move that, uh, oh yeah, haha. <laughs> move your original source back to the file. So in, in other words, you're undoing the patch. Uh, again, this is all kind of pulling the rug out from under Quilt, because uh, you're you're, bypassing it and doing things directly. And then add your patch that you've just created to the series file. 
But then reading another tutorial, I found out that there's quilt push has a minus fuzz option and a minus force option. So you can actually specify the amount of fuzz you want quilt to allow. So this is again, only when you're applying um, or running the quilt command manually, you can, you can do these, these options. And quilt force will actually force a patch which otherwise would have been rejected. I haven't actually tried this. So I say see also, and the tutorials at the bottom uh, refer to, to those. You're on your own if you try it that way. It's supposed to work, but I haven't tried it. So I can't promise you anything. Um, but all of this to say that in the Debian build environment, it's gonna try and run Quilt without those options. So what you have in the end had better be a set of patches that Quilt is happy with that have no fuzz whatsoever. And that is all I have in terms of my presentation. If we still have a little bit of time, I can go to my SSH session and show you some more of the files. I'm also happy to answer questions uh, related to any of these slides or as we go into the SSH session, if there's any questions about that. So first of all, any questions about the slides? As a general impression, do you find uh, the RPM system easier or harder than the, the Debian system? That's a very good question. Um, the easy answer, and it's it's almost facetious, is to say um, I find the RPM environment easier, but that's because I have so many years of familiarity with right. it. So, so it's maybe not a fair... Too, right? Yeah. In general, I've found, like, the whole Debian build environment, I think, has a longer history to it than RPM build. And I think it's gone through more stages of evolution. So in some ways, it feels or seems a little clunkier. Um, I found the same about even just installing binary packages. There were certain things I was used to in the RPM environment that just weren't there, like checksums like install date stamps, things like that are not in, um, in the, the Debian packages themselves. Uh, checksums are there as metadata, but you have to load it separately. And there isn't an equivalent to RPM minus V to verify uh, an installed package to make sure it's still untampered with, right? Um, and when I, Googled for that years ago, what I landed on was a diatribe about how um, that's not reliable because if you got the metadata on your system that might have been tampered with, you can't trust your metadata either. Well, that's, that's true in theory, but it's not very useful in practice, right? So um, yeah, there's things, that, that's a real digression, but all that to say, there are certain things I find about the Debian environment that just feel a little more clunky or cobbled together. And it's maybe because of that longer evolution and they of course had to maintain reverse compatibility. Um, so yeah, even the build environment, I kind of like the, the spec file, maybe because it's, it's what I was familiar with, but having all of your metadata in one, one place is kind of nice. Um, that said, I can see some of the advantages of the way they did set it up. And I can sort of see the evolutionary path of it, you know, the change log started as documentation, but became useful to, if you have a specific syntax, you can use some of this as metadata. You can use it to assist the build process. Um, having the rules file start as just a make file made sense historically, you know? Um, when you're starting from scratch, you want to you want to leverage as much out of existing tools as you can. So I, I, I get the impression that that's the way the Debian environment, build environment came about, is just trying to leverage what was already there. And so it has that kind of feel to it. Whereas maybe in the RPM environment, 
they had the, the benefit of hindsight because they came at it later. So they said, okay, this is nice, but let's do it this way. It'll be a little cleaner. Right, right. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question, which no. maybe it's, uh, maybe I don't know enough about it. Um, is this, so this setup that you demoed, is it limited to essentially building for the current distro that you're running in, or can you actually set up your build environment to, in theory, build for any prior or new, newer version of Ubuntu? Um, yeah, in fact, I, I don't think there's anything specific about what I showed um, other than those few lines of uh, deb source that you'd have in your, your um, uh, sources list file. Um, that is Ubuntu specific. Any of what I've shown here, and in fact, most of the tutorials I was following are of Debian lineage, not Ubuntu lineage. Um, so that same build environment, you should be able to build your package for whatever Ubuntu version you want, whatever Debian version you want, whatever Raspberry Pi OS version you yeah. want. Um, that shouldn't matter. There, that said, there may be tweaks you have to make in, for instance, um, uh, your build dependencies and your dependencies. Um, some of these names may change, right? If, if you're using a different version of a distro or a different distro. Um, when you've listed a greater than or equal uh, version number, you may have to tweak that depending on what build environment right. you're targeting, right? Um, the nice thing of a greater than or equal is it offers you some leeway, but if you had just equals, it's gotta be this version specifically, then you're probably in trouble if you're trying to build for a different distro or even just a different version of the distro. Um, but yeah, if you build your, if you set up your, your control file with enough leeway, you should be able to uh, to work that in other environments. Again, the other thing is some of the metadata, like the section, architecture names, priority. I don't know. Some of that stuff is probably going to change from one distro right. to another. Yeah. yeah. Um, how about build times nowadays? I remember, like, okay, this is going back twenty years or so ago. Uh, somebody did a build in our group back then. It took them like several weeks or a month or something to build libc. Yeah. Uh, is that sort of, does that still happen? Or, you know, how long am I, should I expect? Days or months is very unusual. That would have to be a very complex build. Um, this one is a very simple file. The build from start to finish was a matter of seconds. Um, my Slurm build, on the other hand, I would start the build and I would go for lunch and come back and it was done. Um, I, I don't think I actually did a time on it to see from start to finish what the build time was, but I believe it was on the order of um, more than half an hour, possibly even more than an hour. Yeah. But Slurm is a huge package. Um, and it, it had so many source files that had to be built. It links to so many libraries. It's, it's a huge piece of code. So yeah, that, that one was a significant build, but we're still talking, you know, less than two hours. <laughs> and that was on a fairly fast system as well. I mean, this, <laughs> the reason I was building this custom version of Slurm is we, uh, had just set up a new um, uh, cluster of uh, GPU servers. And uh, I was running on one of the nodes of that to have like the build environment I wanted for that cluster. Um, obviously I wasn't making use of the GPUs during the build, but there was significant memory and horsepower on this server system that I was building on. And it was still a significant amount of time. Oh yeah, and I was building on SSDs for the, the files. So, yeah. 
All right. Uh, any other questions from the room or in the in the chat? Anyone online has a question? <coughs> Very good. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is a fair question, but uh, the, the place where like, most likely we'd make use of this is uh, if we're building some kind of uh, in-house web app or something in the GitLab, and we want to generate like a package as an artifact at the end of the, the build for that. Have you done any experimentation with that yet? Or is this like standalone? No. Okay. Um as I was reading some of the tutorials, I found that in addition to dpackage hyphen build package, there's a git hyphen build package. And the purpose of that would be for source that's already set up in a git repository. Um, so that would be essentially your avenue into building your package from a git uh, source repository. Um, that's about all I can tell you. I haven't actually tried working with that. Um, I don't know if it sets up all the metadata for you, like that whole Debian uh, subdirectory tree, or whether it expects that to be part of your, your Git repository. Um, I know there are commands, I think de build is one of them that uh, will let you work from just a source tree and it will create like the, the template uh, Debian tree structure. Uh, for you, and then you go in and you you tweak your various files, the change log, the control file, and the rules, and all of that. Okay, so RPFM, yeah. and there's like there's on ramps that might help make yeah. this a bit more straightforward. Yeah, okay. follow the links that I have in this tutorial. It's available on the Mug uh, website, and uh, yeah. Um, one caveat about the the tutorials: I've included links to a number of tutorials. Some of them are quite a bit out of date now um, in that they describe things as it was a long time ago, which in some cases is still relevant. I mean, it's not like that stuff has gone away, but it may not be best practices for building packages currently. So as you go through these tutorials, look at what the date of the article is and, you know, Add your grain of salt whose size varies based on the age of the <laughs> source material, right? It's typical yeah. Like when you're looking at old Linux documentation, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Robert. Great presentation.